there are trees so massive that a single one can cover an area the size of three football fields. Some trees even grow taller than the Statue of Liberty. These incredible giants need tons of material to form their wood, branches and leaves. Where do trees get all this material from? Most people would assume it comes from the soil. It seems logical to think the trees absorb everything they need from the ground. But here is the surprising truth. Less than 10% of a tree's total weight comes from the soil. So, where does the rest of the material come from? The answer will amaze you. Now consider this. We know it is impossible to draw water from a very deep well using a regular water pump. That is because suction cannot lift water higher than about 33 feet or 10 meters. Yet, we have trees that grow over 100 meter tall and somehow they manage to transport water all the way to their topmost leaves. How do they achieve this seemingly impossible feat? That is another fascinating mystery. And here is something else to think about. We have heard that the remains of ancient trees buried under the earth for millions of years transformed into coal. But this only happened to trees that lived during a specific period in earth's history. Trees that existed before or after that period never became coal. Why is that? The reason is just as intriguing. Where do trees get the materials they need to grow? How do they manage to transport water to such towering heights? And why will today's trees never turn into coal, no matter how many millions of years pass? Let's explore these fascinating questions in this video. Hi friends, welcome to a new video from Science Simplified for All. We all know that plants absorb water and nutrients from the soil. These nutrients can be divided into two categories, macronutrients and micronutrients. Macronutrients include elements like nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, while micronutrients include elements like iron, manganese, zinc and copper. But here is an interesting fact. Even when you add up all these elements, they account for less than 5% of the total weight of a plant or tree. 95% of a tree's weight comes from just three elements, carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. The major parts of a tree, its roots, trunk, branches and leaves, are all made up of compounds primarily composed of these three elements. Among them, carbon contributes about 45% of the tree's weight, oxygen another 45%, and hydrogen only 5%. So, where do plants get this carbon and oxygen? The answer lies in the air around us. Almost all the carbon and a significant portion of the oxygen in plants and trees come from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The hydrogen, on the other hand, comes from water absorbed by the roots. While water also contains oxygen, plants use only a small portion of it. The rest is released back into the atmosphere. The process responsible for this is photosynthesis, something we all learned about in school. For photosynthesis to occur, plants primarily need three components, carbon dioxide, water and sunlight. Oxygen is the main byproduct of this process. Through the process of photosynthesis, plants primarily produce a compound called glucose. This glucose is then used to create various complex compounds such as cellulose, starch and lignin. These compounds are the building blocks that form the leaves, branches and trunks of plants and trees. Now here is an important detail. The oxygen that plants release during photosynthesis does not come from carbon dioxide. Instead, it comes from the water they absorb. So during photosynthesis, plants keep the oxygen contained in carbon dioxide and releases oxygen contained in water. In short, nearly 90% of a plant's weight comes from the carbon and oxygen found in carbon dioxide, which is directly pulled from the atmosphere. This is why plants can grow so much with so little fertilizer. In methods like hydroponics, where plants are grown using minimal nutrients in liquid form, we often wonder how they manage to produce so many leaves with so little input. But when you realize that the majority of their building materials come from the air, that mystery is solved. When plants and trees die, we often see them decay over time. During this process, the complex compounds in their structure, which we discussed earlier, are broken down by microorganisms like bacteria and fungi. 
these microbes decompose the plant material into simple molecules, which then return to the natural cycle. This is part of the life cycle of plants. Compared to plants, trees have much stronger wood and branches. Among the various compounds that contribute to this strength, lignin plays a key role. In the early history of Earth, large trees did not exist. There were only small plants because the plants of that time could not produce lignin. Around 400 million years ago, as part of evolution, plants developed the ability to produce lignin. This marked the beginning of the formation of trees. At that time, trees had several survival advantages compared to smaller plants. The first advantage was height. Taller trees could capture more sunlight, giving them an edge in photosynthesis. The second advantage was the abundance of carbon dioxide. This was during the Carboniferous period, a time in Earth's history when the atmosphere contained much higher levels of carbon dioxide than it does today. With more carbon dioxide available, trees could produce more glucose through photosynthesis and in turn create larger quantities of lignin and other compounds. As a result, trees spread rapidly across the planet, covering vast areas in a relatively short time in geological terms. However, the widespread growth of trees led to a unique problem. During that era, the bacteria and fungi that existed lacked the ability to decompose lignin. While they could break down other plant materials, they could not decompose the wood of trees. As a result, when these trees died, their trunks and branches did not rot like other plants but remained intact for long periods, lying on the forest floor. For nearly 100 million years, starting from the emergence of trees, fallen trees remained undecomposed. Over time, many of these trees were buried due to geological activities. With their lignin-rich structures intact, they were subjected to immense pressure and heat under the Earth's surface. This process transformed them into coal. The trees that existed during the period between 380 million and 280 million years ago are the ones that eventually became the coal we mine and use today. Around 280 million years ago, some bacteria evolved the ability to decompose lignin. This evolutionary change spread rapidly because there was a massive amount of undecomposed wood available at the time. After this point, dead trees began decomposing like other plants, and the formation of coal from dead trees effectively stopped. Today, all the coal we have comes from trees that lived during that specific 100 million year window. Trees that grew after that period will never become coal, no matter how many millions of years pass. Now, let us explore how water reaches the top of tall trees, even those over 100 meters in height. This is a topic we all learned about in high school. In plants, water evaporates through tiny pores on the leaves called stomata. This process is known as transpiration. As water evaporates, it creates a negative pressure within the leaves. This negative pressure is referred to as transpiration pull. This suction effect pulls water upward through narrow tubes in the plant called xylem. The upward movement of water is supported by two key forces. The first is cohesion, which is the attraction between water molecules. The second is adhesion, which is the attraction between water molecules and the walls of the xylem. This is the explanation we were taught in school, and it is correct. But the process is not as simple as it seems. There is a fundamental limitation to suction. Water cannot be pulled higher than 10 meters due to atmospheric pressure. Let us understand why this happens. Imagine you are drinking water through a straw. What you are actually doing is removing the air from the top of the straw, which reduces the pressure there. The atmospheric pressure acting on the surface of the water in the glass pushes the water up the straw. The same principle applies when using a pump to draw water from a well. The pump creates a low-pressure area at the top of the pipe, and the atmospheric pressure pushes the water upward. However, atmospheric pressure, about one bar, is only strong enough to push water up to a height of 10 meters. If the pipe is taller than 10 meters, atmospheric pressure cannot push water any higher. Even with a powerful positive displacement pump, the best it can do is create a vacuum at the top of the pipe. However, the atmosphere cannot support a water column taller than 10 meters. Additionally, 
as the pressure inside the pipe drops significantly, the water at the top begins to turn into vapor, breaking the water column. This is why, no matter how powerful a pump you use, it is impossible to lift water beyond 10 meters using suction. However, this 10 meter limit applies only to suction. When water is pumped to the upper floors of tall buildings, the pump is placed at the bottom of the building where it pushes the water upward. In such cases, the height of water transport is limited only by the power of the pump and the strength of the pipes, not by atmospheric pressure. But whenever a pump is used to suck water from below, the 10-meter height limit caused by atmospheric pressure applies. Trees, however, use a completely different mechanism. The negative pressure in leaves is not created by removing air. Instead, it is caused by water evaporating during transpiration. This creates a pool that is transmitted downward through the xylem tubes via intermolecular forces between water molecules. Water molecules are held together by a special type of bond called a hydrogen bond. Because of this, the water molecules at the top of the xylem tubes pull the ones directly below them, and so on, creating a continuous chain of water molecules stretching from the roots to the leaves. This process is called the cohesion tension mechanism. Unlike pumps, this mechanism does not rely on atmospheric pressure to push water upward. Instead, it relies on the cohesive forces between water molecules and the adhesion between water and the xylem walls. You do not see this behavior of water in everyday scenarios, such as using a straw or a pipe, because it requires the unique properties of xylem tubes. These tubes have certain characteristics that make this process possible. 1. Xylem tubes are extremely narrow, which helps maintain the cohesive force between water molecules. 2. The inner walls of xylem tubes are very smooth, which prevents water from turning into vapor, even at very low pressures. 3. Xylem tubes maintain a continuous column of water without air bubbles. If an air bubble forms, it breaks the physical connection between water molecules, stopping the flow of water. From the moment a plant begins to grow, its xylem tubes are filled with water. As the plant grows into a tree and its xylem tubes increase in length, the water column remains unbroken. If, for any reason, the xylem tubes lose their water, for example during a drought, the tree will dry out and die. In short, trees use a unique property of water to transport it over 100 meters to their topmost leaves, defying what suction alone could achieve. I hope this video helped you discover some fascinating facts about the unique characteristics of plants and trees. If you found this video interesting, do not forget to like and share it with others. Subscribe to the channel and enable the bell icon for more fascinating content. Thank you for watching.